back in about 40, coming on 50 years of activism, there's kind of certain periods that stand out. There's the intoxicating atmosphere of 70s punk rock. There's a raw class, <coughs> class warfare of the miners' strike. There's community rebellion, the poll tax, and there's exuberance of the reclaim the streets and the social justice movements of the early 21st century. But the Worker City Group has a special place in my heart because it was one of the most enjoyable and one of the most most surprising. And that's not to take away the, the fun. It was certainly fun, but that's not to take away from the seriousness of the campaign. And I think it took uh, John McLean's victim to heart about being cheery. I'll attempt to give a brief overview, overview of the group, or maybe other folk to come in and describe the many different campaigns the group engaged in. The campaign in support of Elspeth, the fight to stop the development of Flesher's Hall, the, the, the football grounds at the side of the green, the free speech and May Day marches in Glasgow Green, and many more uh, spin-off campaigns. The original idea in 1986 for the book came not from Glasgow, but for a novel uh, by Victor Serge, Birth of Our Power, it was a, a story set in a full revolution in Barcelona in 1919 19, that uh, described the shifting class dynamics of the city. Barcelona was one of the great working class cities of the world, like Chicago or St. Petersburg. And I reckoned Glasgow was on par with them, and it, a story should be told. I approached, uh, I mentioned the idea to Farquhar McClay, a good friend of mine, and he took it up with gusto. And with characteristic generosity, he opened up the book to fellow authors and activists and encouraged a contribution. Glasgow had a tough, tough and desperate time in the 1980s, if you can remember it. The, the industrialisation, the, the, the deindustrialisation was almost complete. The drugs problem was rampant and, and uh, the situation was pretty dire. But the best that the the local politicians could come up with was, was um, PR exercises like the Mr. Men and the Garden Festival. And it's something on par with what we've got today with building bridges to, to Ireland from Scotland. It's something like an idea. PR, PR rubbish, surely. I. And Reporting Scotland did one of their wallpaper pieces about the Garden Festival and interviewed a Native American who had bought a, a, an exhibition along with a TP and a wee stand at the Garden Festival. And the reporter blandly asked him what he thought he had in common with Glass Regions. And he replied that we both know what it is to have our heritage stolen from us. The City of Culture was the latest attempt to turn Glasgow's workers from welders into waiters. It can be summed up in the story of the Talbot Centre for the Homeless. 62,000 were spent on stone cleaning the interior, but inside the residents still kept on the floor. The Workers City Group, which was formed round about the, group, uh, round about the book, joined forces with other dissidents in a city like the Free University Network and the Friends of the People's Palace. Anarchists from the distinctive Glasgow tradition like Farker, myself and others, hooked up with Hugh Savage, Les, Les Forster and Ned Donaldson from Harry McShane's Marxist Human Tradition. And we were joined by many people that the Labour leader, uh, Pat Lally, described in the Herald as freelance versus <laughs> an honourable title. <laughs> Legendary meetings were held in the packed alcove of the Scotia Bar on Monday nights and we planned the week's activities. Brendan McLaughlin, who ran the Scotia, was a great source of encouragement and he reminded me of the innkeeper 
and so was Germano, who was an agent of the First International. <laughs> we challenged Pavarotti uh, when he came to give a concert in Glasgow, and we leafleted the first time ever, I think, that an opera concert had been lifted, lifted by a left wing group. <laughs> and uh, complete with lots of bad dad, bad dad jokes about there being a lot of Pavarotti in Glasgow. <coughs> press, press passes were forged to disrupt council press conferences. Hugh Savage toured the Glasgow schemes with a loudspeaker van and in the belly of the beast, unknown to the council upstairs, Clydeside Press churned out thousands of Glasgow Keeleys and flyers. There was a lot of joyous creativity and my favourite was the was a Lally chamber pot, which you see in display over there. Sorry, I'm just... <laughs> 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 which I think harkens back to a much <coughs> older traditions and could easily have been envisaged in, in Robert Burns day. In some ways, the, the group that met in the Scotia was like the Crook Island Sensibles that met in Burns day in Edinburgh. But were much more effective. They were just they were just a drinking club, but <laughs> similar idea the com the comradeship that came from that time. Uh, an aspect that came as a light surprise to me was the liveness and energy of the many pensioners that took part in our campaigns, pickets, and activities. I had previously associated old age with ge geriatric pilot bureaus from the Soviet era, and been sh an old stu stu stuck in the mud. 30 years on, and as a pensioner myself now, I can see some of the advantages of growing old. You keep your eyes on the prize, you have an impatience to get things done, and you have a lack of concern for bureaucratic positions. It's a case of raging against the dying of the light with rage against the machine. One thing that the campaign could be rightfully criticised for, although would be gender balance, there was very few women involved in the group. Maybe it was a pop-centred activity that was a problem. Maybe it was a political attitude shaped decades before. People have blamed Clydesidism. Uh, but the Red Clyde period started with the women's red strikes in 1915. And recent reading has shown that women like Helen Crawford were involved in every street meeting and demonstration of the First World War. Right up to the Council Eco Pay Strikes of today, and with now women making up more than half of Glasgow's working population. Less than half of Glasgow's story has been told. When the idea of a meeting about Workers City came up, someone suggested we should invite everyone that was originally involved. Unfortunately, we'd had to organise a seance. For the record, here are some of the good, many good folk that we've lost over the past 30 years. Farker McClay, Freddie Anderson, John Taylor Caldwell, Ned Donaldson, Robert Lynn, Ian McKechnie, Jack Withers, Hugh Savage, Les Forster, Jeff Torrington, James D. Young, Dominic Bean, William Sutherland, Phil McPhee, and John McGargle, who died tragically in the, the Clutha fire. A real rule of honour there. <coughs> Glasgow may no longer be the classical industrial city, but it will always be a worker's city. The classical industrial cities probably exist now only in places like China, and in our ignorance we don't even know their names. But as, uh, but as Farker wrote, tradition and heritage shouldn't be an altar to be worshipped at. There should be a spark that gives life, and it can be struck again to give life in our own time. It's a tradition that re-emerges defiantly with every generation. And it may well be emerging in Glasgow in the, the march on Friday with the global strike, which hopefully folk will be able to attend. I'd like to introduce now uh, Jim Kelman, a good, good friend, original participant from the, from the Worker City group, to give a wee spiel about what you made of, of Worker City. Right, totally. Thank you. Thanks. Well, <laughs> Tommy's done such a comprehensive introduction, really, uh, and it, it, it's great to hear some of the names that Tommy's referring to, you know, the, uh, and 
what I think I, I should maybe do just to emphasise before a, a general discussion starts is refer to the levels of experience that was around and I think that's what was so important. People had been involved in various forms of activism that I know personally from, a, you know, well we can go back to like the, the 1940s really. Uh, and so we're talking Ned Donaldson, Les Foster, Freddie Anderson, Hugh Savage and others. I mean, not only people who theorised politically, but people who were, who were activists and went through various, various things, you know. And I should add Robert Lynn to that. I'm thinking of Robert Lynn especially is also because of his, uh, when he talks about when he kind of moved to uh, anarchism or, or moved away from certain things to do with the CP during the apprentices' strikes during the Second World War, one of which uh, Huey, Huey Savage probably led the most important one, but because it was so CP dominated, in fact, they didn't support a later strike, and that was when Robert Bobby Lynn decided that, that, that he had had enough of that. But, but Robert was also uh, one of what you might call people who were not those who turned up every Monday night in the Scotia Bar, as Tommy's saying, or also later on in the transmission when Billy Clark and Carol Rhodes and Malcolm and Ewan and others were operating a transmission gallery. And that became also a kind of uh, a second, not so much a second home, but a place where we also held uh, uh, meetings when people uh, were, uh, like, when, when it had expanded. So I'm seeing uh, John, John Cooper, I'm reminded of the night John was at and others here, a transmission night when, for instance, uh, we had heard because of a series of articles we were doing in corruption, council corruption. We ran a couple about the Gorbals and we had heard word that the, some heavy people from the Gorbals were going to come and disrupt a meeting. So in fact, uh, old Huey brought down Rory. Rory uh, was this tremendous dog, you know, that could have eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just going to set the dog free. But I remember, I think you were there, uh, John, I'm seeing you there and I seem to remember seeing you there. Others were there, Keith, Keith Dixon would have been there, Billy and many others. Uh, it was, but it was that kind of feel for it, you know, was like, well, you would just take people on. The same when we were doing the thing in People's Palace in Glasgow Green. They were, we got a lot of heavy, there was a lot of heavy stuff that we, you were getting from people associated with the council. But the, the intimidation, I think, that people had been through within Worker City is such that they could not intimidate them in these ways. People had been through so much more kind of, uh, uh, no, well, some physical stuff. It wouldn't just be unphysical. It was through so much aggravation over such a long period of political activism that that kind of level of intimidation just didn't work. It really didn't work, you know. And it was it was also a kind of party, a, a non-party political basis. This was one of the strengths and community activism. Again, mentioned John would know. Uh, it would be the kind of levels of community organisation in the 70s. And Brendan McLaughlin and others who were also around in the 60s. And to see the way in which, uh, even at that point, the state fingers were coming in. For example, in Easter House, where Freddie and, Freddie and Isabel Anderson were involved, and, and others, maybe some people here, uh, when you notice that the state were in it, began to be kind of hijacked by, you know, people around old uh, Frankie Vaughan and so on. But, the important point is simply that these kind of movements on the ground were being hijacked, those kind of up towards the down and the part of the strength of Worker City. There was no political, uh, no party basis to it. There were people involved uh, in parties who used to pass us very important information. People involved with the Labour Party and so on uh, would leave uh, things for us in pigeonholes. Uh, so there was this kind of level of expertise and, I mean, in terms of like the, the inability to be intimidated, I would think, I would just finish with one example, would be the time, uh, was the great time when we, we entered into the city chambers. And uh, I mean, that was really a classic one. It was the first time that had happened since 1919. You know, the, the man of Shinwell, Willie Gallagher, uh, the, the 40 hour week, uh, that, that was the first time that had happened. And they sent for the cops. Uh, I mean, the Labour Council, that was their first thing. What we do, send for the cops. And that's what they did, you know. And at that time, they were forced into giving a meeting. 
and there was about more than 200 people there that day, pickets right outside the city chambers. And they, they said, uh, you know, send in your representatives, you know, and, and oh, shoot, tell me, fuck off, there's no representatives. <laughs> Make room for 200 people, you know, everybody got in, and that was what had to happen. Everybody went in to sit down. Well, the councillors were very kind of sheepish to discuss certain issues, but it was that level of expertise and great levels of experience, and that was also why things happened. I mean, also, it reminds me that there was input from Three Uni. Uh, I had just, personally, I didn't become involved until, I remember it quite clearly, it was like the weekend after the self-determination event with uh, Noam Chomsky and people were here. Uh, many people here were involved in organising some of the same free university that you'll see around here. <laughs> Uh, that, that we had also been very strongly involved, uh, in fact it, it started from us that event, but I remember feeling a wee bit kind of scunnered by some levels of what had taken place and I saw Farker's uh, editorial and number one, the number one Keeley if anyone gets it, I think it's just a broadsheet, and the number one editorial Farker had just written down that there was no excuse for not attending this and it was a demonstration against Glasgow's Glasgow under the arches and it was to take place on Saturday morning so for me it was almost like a, it was either like a, a few pints of Guinness or go to a meeting you know so I went to a meeting it was too early for but and I turned up at this meeting at the, uh, Glasgow Glasgow and Freddie and Isabel were there that was the first I saw was Freddie and Isabel oh and there was Huey Savage and there was Les Foster and others and somebody from the Telegraph had come to interview old Freddie and, Fre and Farker was there as well. Freddie says uh, something like, oh, there's about ten writers here, you know, so this guy from the Telegraph was looking. We'll hold a press conference in McSorley's bar there, just across <laughs> the road, you know. So there was an awful lot of kind of experiences like that, uh, and fun, and also very serious campaigning. You know, I see Michael here in Elspeth, very serious campaign, and major changes that were done, you know, probably, uh, 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 you know, the Glasgow Green one. But that's enough from me. Uh, open a discussion, I think Tommy's going to open it. <laughs> <laughs>